three of these today, the Rorschach test, the cybernetic revolution of the 1930s and 40s that continue on afterwards, and then the problem of disposing of nuclear waste and how to market and imagine a far distant future. The general scheme is to say, what are the, what are the conditions, the technological conditions, for us to be able to think about the self in particular ways? Not as Immanuel Kant would have had it, the general conditions for the world of, to be such that any object could exist, but rather the specific technological conditions that are available in a particular place and time that help shape or reshape the self. Um, and in the case of the Rorschach test, what is it that people thought about how the self is composed such that this test made sense to them? And that then, in a second move, how that test began to condition us to think about ourselves in a particular way. In the 19th century, there were ink blots. They were fairly common. It was typically a game that people played, a kind of parlor game. And the idea was to try to train or test the imagination. So for example, at Harvard in the end of the 19th century, one psychologist said to see things in the ever-changing outlines of summer clouds or the embers of a fire has been to imaginative men a source of entertainment and delight. Or again later, to reproduce under applicable and controllable conditions these familiar studies of human fancy or imagination, the means, following means have been adopted, chance blots of ink, and then we ask a person, what do they imagine? What do they picture when they see this? At the end of the 19th century as well, Alfred Binet, who created many of the tests uh, that become tests of intelligence, tests of ability in various ways, divided intelligence into 10 categories. Memory, how many numbers could you remember? How many images could you <coughs> store in your head? Uh, how much you could gain by looking at a map just at a glance. This was something the military valued in classifying soldiers. But one of them was the imagination. And the specific test for imagination was an ink blot. Now, that began to change with Rorschach, who did not think that these were tests of the imagination. He did not think that there were faculties of the mind, each of which, like memory or calculation, or imagination could be tested with a specific test. But he would take, for instance, silhouette puppets, put them on a screen, and ask you to tell a story about it. Almost all subjects, Rorschach wrote, regard the experiment, that is the ink blot, as a test of imagination, because that's what the 19th century had believed universally, that there were faculties of the mind, and each one had a test. This conception is so general that it becomes a condition of the experiment. No, says Hermann Rorschach, the interpretation of chance forms falls in the domain of perception, not imagination. That's a crucial distinction, which I want to go into. So he began to make these ink blots. And he, this was a draft of the, one of the plates, for instance, on the left. And uh, he rejected it, and he kept making new plates, because what he wanted to test was what people saw as a fundamental reflection of their, the inner configuration of how their minds worked. And so each person would filter a given stimulus in a particular way that could be used to characterize uh, their perceptual inclinations. This is the way the final ink blot looked. This one on the left, for instance, was rejected because it had a black border. And he said, depressives always saw this as a death notice. And then they couldn't think about anything else for the rest of the test. So he experimented over several years trying to get the right images, like this one. Or these, this is another series of tests uh, that he tried. Uh, by the fourth one, on the bottom right, 
he began to notice that people would start to see these as human forms. And in the final card that's part of the canonical test that's been applied, used millions of times in hospitals, psychiatric hospitals all around the world, uh, he used this. He saw this like a test pattern. When you're testing a lens, you have a standard pattern, you use your new lens, and you see what it could, what the, what the lens records, and you compare that to the original. And because you have a standard stimulus, you can test the particular aspects of the lens. Does it record color properly? How fine a line can it distinguish? Does it create more patterns and so on? One of the uh, psychiatrists at this time, L.K. Frank said, the self is like a test object. The subject is made to bend, deflect, distort, organize, or otherwise pattern part or all of the field in which it is placed. We elicit a projection of the individual's personality's private world because he has to organize the field. We put up a field. And then each of us sees different things in that field. Those perceptions can be characterized and used to define the self as he saw it. Here's how it worked. You had, for instance, a subject, S, and an examiner. And the subject says, can I turn the slide? And the examiner says, it's up to you. Should I try to use all of it? Whatever you like. Different people see different things. The examiner is instructed to be as neutral as possible, just to not answer anything in any particular direction, just to reflect back what the subject asks. Do you want me to show you where I see it, if you like? And then a side comment. It's probably best at this point to avoid any mention of the fact that we're then going to make more detailed inquiries later on. Subject, should I just use my imagination? Yes, just tell me what you see. It is more appropriate to use the word see rather than reminds you of to test questions of this sort, stressing perception rather than association. He doesn't want people to say, oh, that reminds me of an elephant. He wants you to say, I see an elephant. I see a table. I see a woman. I see a man. Is this the kind of thing you want, says the subject. Yes, it just looks whatever it looks like to you. Is that the right answer? There are all sorts of answers. Does it look like that to you, asks the subject. Oh, says the examiner, I can see lots of things. And then there's an inquiry phase where you, you've written down all the responses, and you then inquire about what they've seen. The subject says, I suppose this, so you're taught a kind of shorthand to be able to record this quickly. <coughs> I suppose this could be a woman in the center, the examiner. And then you said, suppose this could be a woman in the center. Subject, yeah, see here, uh, this is her shape, and she's got her hands up like she's waving or something. Then there's a scoring. Does, this, does the response use the whole or a part? Is it a detail or a whole? Does it use color or not? Does it involve movement or not? Does it have a form or does it just say, I see red, I see red liquid, I see blood, I see oil? If, you just, if it's formless, then that's also, is it an animal? Is it human? And so and then from these scores, they put them into categories. There are composite personality categories for distinctions between depression, or anxiety, suicidality, uh, uh, many other things. And so it was even tried for a time to make machine scoring. Once you'd scored this, to have the machine evaluate what the diagnostic was to make distinctions between manic depression and schizophrenia, for example. So the, this is the machine output. It says, the following hypotheses are listed solely to provide an orientation of the data. A full analysis is required to confirm or reject their validity. Suicide potential. The Rorschach test indicates a very strong suicide risk. Take precautions. But other psychiatrists said they did not want this to be seen as a machine or a protocol or algorithmic driven procedure. Instead, the various studies based on shortcuts and sign approaches cannot be considered valid clinically or acceptable. When patterns are applied mechanically, all evaluation of the dynamics of personalities is excluded. This is a distortion of the Rorschach method. So there was a dispute between people who wanted to automate and people that wanted to keep it clinical interactive. 
In the late uh, 20th century, an American survey showed that almost 8,000 federal and state court cases that used Rorschach testimony and concluded that only in a single case was the testimony denied, challenged, or unsuccessfully in five others. Among clinicians in the mid-1990s, over 80% regularly used the test. So it, sometimes people will say, oh, well, that's 1920s. It's still very common in psychiatric testimony. And it becomes a kind of master metaphor in our newspapers and writing and thinking and speaking. I just, there are thousands of these. I, I, I took a few just randomly. In this sense, the whole wilderness area is really just a Rorschach test for the imagination. Or the bare words of the Constitution are just a Rorschach ink blot that. Or because you are, they are making a political issue out of something that could have easily remained just a Rorschach test of what one thought of the war, and so on. Barack Obama, when he was president, at one point said, I am a Rorschach to the world. And they project on me what they uh, what they have. So it becomes a part of our routine. And that ubiquity of the way the technology is used is partly what I mean by a shaping of the self. In this case, you had to have, we trained to, you know, to administer the Rorschach. We had a night, the whole of the 19th century using ink blots as a measure of imagination. So it was there when Rorschach tried, you know, reappropriated it to be a measure of perception without the kind of faculty-based psychology of the 19th century, that we were composed of these centers of cognition and affect, like memory and calculation and so on. He, Rorschach didn't have anything to do with that, but he wanted a method that could navigate without being committed to Freudianism or Jungian or any other particular frame. He wanted something that was neutral. Uh, like Switzerland itself, where he was working, that would be a kind of mediating quality among these various schemes. So we train to administer the Rorschach test independently of any theory. In a certain sense, we are also training to take them. The Rorschach test teaches us to think of the scientific self alternately as a magic lantern that projects upon the blank screen of the world, or on the president, or on the war, or whatever it is, or as a lens that characteristically alters the neutral pattern of the world and composes it um, in as if we had sort of a, a, a series of bandpass filters built into our perceptual apparatus. Okay, this kind of approach is what I have in mind more generally. So for example, in turning towards the cybernetic moment that continues in many ways to today, uh, take on a different set of technologies the historical configuration of the self such that feedback systems were thought to resemble the body or constitute purpose or intention. And I'll, I'll talk, talk about this in a second. And then once this sort of idea of feedback machines becomes built into our everyday perception, it begins to alter who we think we are. And you know, it's, it, it's in a way the outcome of that that we can begin to say today that uh, generalized intelligence and algorithmically driven generalized intelligence is what a large language model gives us. That chat GPT, it, to say it's sentient, is the end product of a long process of acculturation to the idea that these uh, uh, dynamic systems actually were like us or we were like them. I want to tell a bit about that story now. So already in 1900, Tesla, the famous inventor, electrodynamic engineer, um, designed a guided boat that would, you could put in the water, and even though it was being hit by waves, it would nonetheless, using feedback, reorient itself and head in a particular direction at a particular speed. There was a larger movement in the early 20th century to make mechanical models of cognitive functions. For instance, conditioned inhibition, something that be the behaviorists were interested in. You could, you, know, you could train a pigeon or a mouse or whatever to, to, to not do something by giving it something it didn't like when it did something until it was inhibited about eating or pushing a lever or moving into a certain place. Anticipatory defense reaction, generalization even, purpose mechanism, 
It's the purpose mechanism that interests me here. And in 1931, these sort of sophisticated behaviorists who wanted to use it to model cognitive functions, who didn't just want behaviorism to be, you know, eat when the bell rings or don't eat when the bell rings, uh, set, built a museum of psychic machines or began to plan such a, and there was a model for subject world relationships and feedback mechanical means that would supposedly model purposive behavior. During World War II, these feedback machines took on a huge role, uh, both from the, for the Axis and for, for, for the Allies. The V-1 flying bomb, the cruise missile that the, that the Germans designed, uh, used feedback to, to get it to its target. Uh, the Americans in 1944 began using a proximity fuse that would um, tell the bomb to explode at a particular height or at a particular distance from a ship or on a torpedo and so on. That experience during the war, where Norbert Wiener was very much involved in, in trying to design a means to predict where an airplane would be several seconds in the future, if you wanted to shoot down a German bomber, you had to know not where it is now from radar, but where it was going to be. So uh, he, d he began designing a, uh, a system that would measure the position of the airplane over time and to use the behavior of the past statistically to predict the future. So not a generic feature, it wasn't taking the average and then interpolating, it was saying you know, if, if the pilot's going like this, then it would expect the pilot to continue to go like this, so it would use that to aim seven or eight seconds in the future of where the airplane was to, to where it would be in order to shoot it down. So that's what statistical prediction was. And at the time, during the war, it seemed practically miraculous that it could predict the future in this way. It seemed uncanny in a strict sense of uncanny. This is what it looked like. He actually began building them at MIT in, in, in the war uh, by, by 42. And he, he said this, it does not seem even remotely possible to eliminate the human element as far as it shows itself in enemy behavior. Therefore, in order to obtain as complete a mathematical treatment as possible of the overall control problem, it is necessary to assimilate the different parts of the system to a single basis. And that single basis should either be human or machine-like. Since our understanding of the mechanical elements of gun pointing appeared to us to be far ahead of our psychological understanding, we chose to try to find a mechanical analog of the gun pointer and the airplane pilot. In other words, treat the airplane pilot and the airplane as simply a, a statistics generating machine. You study the, the, the overall behavior of the system and you use that to predict the future. No psychology involved, nothing about fear or evasive action, just just what are the statistics of altitude and, and direction and speed? So Stibitz uh, visits the Wiener's laboratory at MIT and says this, most of the day in his diary, most of the day is spent with Wiener, Bigelow, and Mooney. For a one second lead, the behavior of their instrument is positively uncanny. Warren Weaver, the head of the Rockefeller Foundation, which was supporting a lot of this research, threatens to bring along a hacksaw to, on the next visit to cut through the legs of the table to see if they don't have some hidden wires somewhere. It seemed so weird. You could take a, a, a flashlight and point it at the ceiling and move it around. The machine would measure where the spot was and then predict where it was going to be next. That's what seemed so uncanny. Um, it was like the experience that people have the first time they try a large language model. And it seems to be <coughs> uncannily human-like in its response. That's how it felt to, to them. Wiener points out that their equipment is probably one of the closest mechanical approaches ever made to physiological behavior. Parenthetically, the Wiener predictor is based on good 
behavioristic ideas, since it tries to predict the future actions of an organism, not by studying the structure of the organism, but by studying the past behavior of the organism. Just the externally measurable qualities, not trying to attribute any internal state to the pilot. It never actually worked in battle, and Wiener records in 1943, I wish I had been able to produce something to kill a few of the enemy instead of merely showing how not to try to kill them. And then other psychologists, like the senior American psychologist, uh, uh, Boring, that's his name, strangely enough, but what I had done before is to make out a list of what I thought all the functions of the brain are, putting them in positivistic reaction terms of the organism, terms which could be translated into an input and output, an adjustment of a mysterious box with binding posts and knobs on it. That's what a person really is. So you can see this movement from trying to accomplish a particular task, namely to figure out where an airplane will be in seven seconds in the future, it becomes now people are starting to say, well, that's really what a person is. Not just that's the best way of accounting for their future behavior, that's actually who we are. It's this movement towards a redefinition of the self that interests me. This book came out just at the end of the war, 1948, Cybernetics by, by Norbert Wiener becomes a huge bestseller. It gets read or bought by many people. And um, Wiener, by 1950, says, the term purposeful is meant to denote that the act or behavior may be interpreted as directed to the attainment of a goal, to a final condition in which the behaving object reaches a definite correlation in time and space with respect to another object or event, like the anti-aircraft pointer. Purposeless behavior, then, is that which is not interpreted as directed to a goal. Not everybody liked this. Uh, Richard Taylor, a philosopher, said, why not put a missile on a wire strung to the, heart, to the target? If it's just following the wire, is, does that count as purposeful? The expression target-seeking missile is metaphorical. Correct, but hardly significant. Wiener, no, it's not the same thing. Unlike the clock, history enters into the predictor. But more importantly, we believe that men and other animals are like machines from the scientific standpoint because we believe that the only fruitful methods for the study of human and animal behavior are the methods applicable to the behavior of mechanical objects as well. Thus, our main reason for selecting the terms in question was to emphasize that as objects of scientific inquiry, humans do not differ from machines. It was on the cover of Time magazine, the cybernetic, the cybernetic thinking. You can see this hybrid of machine and human. There's an eyeball, a hand. It's military. It's calculational. And so he's gone through, he goes through a series of, of steps. The target as a feedback device, the gunner as a feedback device, physiology, you know, our ability to see, feel where my hand is and grasp the wire is a feedback process. The over, you know, to avoid overreach or oscillation, you have to have that damp prediction of the future. Feedback system does become purpose for Wiener, and then he begins to see the world as one cybernetic system. The scientist, he declared late in his life, is always working to discover the order and organization of the universe, and is thus playing a game against the arch enemy disorganization. Is this devil Manichaean or Augustinian? Augustinian was a set of fixed laws that the scientist was trying to crack. Manichaean was facing an enemy that was changing tactics in response to your actions. Is it a contrary force opposed to order or the very absence of order itself? And so these sorts of questions preoccupied him, but in a way, he saw the, our encounter with ourselves, with each other, with an enemy, with the world, with natural law, as all part of a similar oppositional encounter. And this was then generalized more generally when Gregory Bateson, the anthropologist and theorist of anthropology, used, began to use these ideas to reformulate his philosophy of anthropology, the double bind hypothesis, many other things. Uh, when he was treating alcoholics, for instance, uh, he, he, 
he, he, he began to use this idea of a feedback uh, system. So these psychic machines may have started out as simple models of a motor that's, you know, that has a governor, but by the end becomes a shaping force in how we understand ourselves, neural modeling, artificial intelligence, cognitive psychology, and many other areas. You see it also in Tur the Turing test and many aspects of our ideas about intelligence. So you have these early technologies like that early ink block or Tesla's automatic boat, but they're reframed to be a Rorschach test or a cybernetic predictor, and then these these new machines begin to reshape us in a much more generally ubiquitous fashion. Okay, last instance. Uh, nuclear waste was produced in enormous quantities during the Manhattan Project and continued afterwards because every, it, there was always some reason why the environmental sh should not be taken into account. It was the middle of a war, it was the Cold War, whatever it was, there was something so pressing that we couldn't stop to to really think about where, where, the, where this nuclear waste was going. And uh, as other countries gained, uh, the, you know, began building nuclear power and nuclear weapons, they too entered into the same sort of just forceful idiocy of just dumping waste into the oceans and streams into ground. These are 55 gallon drums filled with plutonium infested waste and it's just being dumped into a pit. Um, and we might think of the distinction between wastelands and wilderness as being opposite ends of some enormous spectrum. Wastelands were full purity, and, and, and wilderness was the, you know, sorry, wilderness was full purity, and wastelands was fully defiled. Um, but what I want to talk about is how nuclear wastelands, as they've come to be much more extensive, Places like Chernobyl and Fukushima, many other places now, these uh, they begin to be thought of as sacrifice zones, become uh, have a new topology where the waste and the wilderness have begun to merge in various ways. And I think one might think of them as a form of waste wilderness. So here, take our object. What is what is our relationship to land where we shouldn't be, either too because it's too pure wilderness or two defiled wastelands. What position, how does this land then train us up to think of ourselves differently in relationship to the physical landscape around us? <clears throat> the geography of nuclear waste is quite extensive. This is in the United States. This is where nuclear waste is stored, uh, you know, over a huge part of the densely populated parts of the United States. Uh, in the world, the nuclear waste is, you know, basically if you take the map and distort each country by the amount of waste that it has, it looks like this. So you see um, France looms pretty large, uh, much bigger than its physical geography, uh, whereas uh, Central America, South America, much smaller, uh, and China, you can see Russia, you see, and, and, and so on. So when the United States began to try to think about how to dispose of its weapons waste. They, the Congress said, well, you can build a disposal site for it, but we're, the Environmental Protection Agency has to regulate it. The Environmental Protection Agency said, okay, well, how long does this stay dangerous? Is it a week, a month, a year, 10 years? And uh, well, the half-life of plutonium is 24,000 years. And when plutonium decays, it turns into uh, isotopes of uranium that can last millions of years. So they decided to specify a regulatory period of 10,000 years. Now, as far as I know, no law ever has had a governing period of 10,000 years, but that's what uh, the Department of Energy, the makers of the bomb and the managers of the site had to follow. At the Yucca Mountain site, which they, which was excavated at the cost of several billion dollars but never used, people, the, the people who were opposed to it said, well, the plutonium is going to last a lot longer than 10,000 years. Why, why, you really need 10, at minimum, 10 half-lives. 10 times 24,000 is 240,000 years. 
But the Department of Energy said, look, we, 10,000 years is twice recorded human history. Millions of years is the evolutionary, way beyond the evolutionary history of human beings. So protecting our descendants millions of years in the future, it's, they're not even us. They're not, they're not human anymore uh, if humans have, have been around for pick your date, but 200,000, 300,000 years in, and in two or three million years, they're not, we're not likely to resemble us. So a site was chosen in New Mexico and um, in the southeast corner. And it would be built in a salt layer uh, down um, about 2,000 feet from the surface. And it, looked like, it looks like this. Uh, so, a technical mishap. I was going to show you some film from from inside it, but I'll just we'll just have to leave it as, as still images. And in order to do that, they the Department of Energy withdrew, that is to say, seized uh, several 16 square miles, four miles by four miles, that had to be surrounded by both passive uh, obstacles that would try to prevent people fences or signs and so on, or active measures that would keep people from entering the land. So to do that, they had to say, well, what would be the danger? Why would people enter this site? Well, if they were deliberately looking for waste because they wanted to use it for some industrial or terrorist or other purpose, you can't stop them 10,000 years from now. But we wanted, they wanted to present, prevent somebody from inadvertently entering the site. So they said, well, who, who can tell us what the future is going to be, society is going to be like 10,000 years in the future. And I said, okay, well, well, we'll contact the people who are making scenarios for the future. And those scenarios could be, for instance, during World War II, the Air Force in the United States was asked to predict how World War III would be fought. And so with nuclear weapons and rockets and what it would be like, satellites and so on, there were um, industrial folks that were interested in predicting the future uh, Shell Oil was very involved with trying to make these scenarios. The nuclear weapons, nuclear war planners were interested in this. And so there were these scenarios that Herman Kahn was one of the people that led this. It became an effort that was embodied in the Rand Corporation. And so he, they had these scenarios with names like Armageddon, the final battle between good and evil, presaging the end of the world. Uh, King Arthur's final battle with Mordred, a legendary inquiry into the accidental start of major conflict, used as a sort of mythic model simplified of the beginning of World War I. Or the European peace from 1871 to 1914, the balance of power that could fail in a hugely unlikely way, and, and so on. So they would make these scenarios, and um, so the, they, they brought these futurists in who were, who had, who were predict, trying to predict three years, five years, 10 years into the future, and said, you know, okay, predict 10,000 years. And they said, you know, 10,000 years? How could we possibly do that? But so they were enlisted, there were material scientists, and they were, I mean, anthropologists and sociologists, and uh, they had one of one scenario was a Houston to L Los Angeles underground train that might pass through the site underground, dug by robots and out of human control. One was a, uh, a feminist alternative potash corporation that, did, that on principle didn't <clears throat> want to believe in what they thought of as uh, characteristically uh, male supremacist ideas of scientific predictability. They're robotic mole miners. They were treasure hunters. Like you know, when you say, we read Egyptian tombs that say, don't enter here, you and your descendants will die miserable deaths, that you know, the archeologists say, oh, there's something valuable there, we'll, we'll dig. So they were worried about that, so that warning people could actually serve to induce them to dig. Uh, there was the Voyager, Voyager 1 is now having trouble talking to us, 15 billion miles away, but there was this plaque that was designed um, to try to communicate who we were to some distant civilization. And speaking to aliens seemed like a good model for speaking to 400 generations in the future. There were you know, archaeologists who said, you know, what, where is the past able to speak to us? Uh, Stonehenge, not so well. We have some ideas about some of the possible astronomical uses, 
pyramids, we know a little bit more uh, about them because we have some inscriptions. The Acropolis, we have a lot more information because it's a combination of tactile, visible archaeology and all the written sources from Periclea and Athens. So they thought, okay, well, from this we can learn that we need to combine physical and, and script and inscription. There were archaeologists that thought there were universal human signs of horror or disgust or sickness and that you could find some universal system to communicate with the future that would not be cultural or historically dependent. So they began using these scenarios of possible intrusion and these theories about what communication or communicative skills were like, they began to design at Sandia Labs, one of the big uh, nuclear weapons labs in the United States, located on Kirkland Air, Air, Air Force Base in, in, in New Mexico, they began to design these, these structures. So this was a message kiosk that would have different levels of detail, like the first was just, don't go here. The second was, here's something about why you shouldn't go here. And the third was like, here's what we know about nuclear isotopes, their health dangers, and in detail, what they're likely to be like in 10,000 years and so on. One idea that they had based more on this universalist notion of trans-historical, trans-cultural uh, communication was that a spike field would somehow show that there were something dangerous poking up through the earth. A variant of that was spikes bursting through a grid, which was supposed to communicate a kind of Cartesian rationality pierced by the dangers of, um, that lurked below the earth. Um, another was called menacing earthworks, where uh, this was actually chosen to be one of the ones that would be built once the WIP site was no longer in operation. Um, so it's still in operation, so nothing's been built. But this one was supposed to be one that was uh, popular. There was one called Black Hole, which since I work on black holes, I have a particular affinity to. But it's a, it's a, it's a darkened area of the, this hard desert floor, where the salt and, and desert floor, where the whip site is. And it would become so hot, you wouldn't want to be on it. Uh, of course, it's demonstrated by having two people stand on it, so it's a little bit self-sabotaging. <laughs> but that was another possibility. Another was a kind of imitation city um, that was uninhabitable, unarable. You couldn't use it. To, you couldn't go there. But you could just see it. So it was something that defied our use. And so this was supposed to be another way of warning people. It would be a, a boundary around the four-mile square that looked like this with rubble in the middle, like huge chunks of uninteresting concrete fragments like a destroyed civilization. So now to wilderness. So a wilderness, in contrast with these kind of areas of contamination, was recognized in 1964 in the United States as a community of life and an area of the earth untrammeled by human beings, where man himself is a visitor who does not remain. It's where we shouldn't be. In a way, it's like the wasteland, the nuclear wasteland you could go for a short period, but you shouldn't stay there. You shouldn't make your house there. You shouldn't live there. You shouldn't grow crops there. Only this is the opposite. This is a wasteland, a wilderness that's so pure that we shouldn't live there. We shouldn't build houses there. We shouldn't grow things there. It should stay outside of us. Um, federal land re retaining its primeval character and influence without permanent improvements, protected and managed so as to preserve its natural conditions. So then you begin to have wasteland becoming wild. So one highly contaminated site had all sorts of terrible chemical warfare agents and bomb testing and Rocky Mountain Arsenal um, was removed from human use. And now, while the industrial core of the site was contaminated, deer, prairie dogs, coyotes, hawks, owls began to use this, protected from 40 years of urban sprawl and development. At Savannah River site, where a third of the arsenal of plutonium weapons, the plutonium for a third of the arsenal was built um, in the, on the river, the Savannah River separating South Carolina and Georgia in the southeastern United States. You had these logs of sort of glassified, vitrified um, plutonium 
waste. Uh, and uh, so the animals there began to proliferate, but they're also contaminated. These are radioactive alligators that live on, on the site. Uh, unfortunately, for some reason, it's not playing. But there was also a program to investigate use that, way, that wilderness was thought of as a kind of benchmark, a kind of zero point uh, that when you were exposed to radioactive materials, you could measure precisely what the biotic effects were. And so there was a program to try each of the different ecological arenas from jungle to Arctic tundra, everything in between, to see what the effects of this were. Then, of course, came Fu Fukushima in March of 2011. And um, this film that gets referred to here, but I'm not able to show you the clips from it, uh, is called Containment, and that came out to this. But so we, while we were making the film, Fukushima happened, and I went there to, to film in that, in that area. This is a still, unfortunately, from the film. Uh, of what some of the town, one of the towns looked like around Fukushima. This uh, young woman would come back once a month to just keep her house from being completely taken over by rodents and, and other animals and, and, and destroyed. Um, uh, there was a, there's, and people began to look at these monuments that had been made by the Japanese to warn of tsunamis. And they go back 800 years. And there are these markers say, whatever you do, don't build below this point, because the tsunami reached here. And in a sense, the monuments that the WIP site was, trying, was thinking of building, or was mandated to build by Congress through the Environmental Protection Agency and the Department of Energy, was saying, whatever you do, don't dig below here. One meant below in a topographical sense. The other went in a, below in a in a literal sense of into the ground. But no matter how much contingency they figured, there was the kind of accident that actually happened in like all of the major nuclear accidents was rather unforeseen. And that was, they had a discussion about, their, so they're waste liquids. And you want to bury, you know, say some test unit that's got plutonium infestation. And you, they're not allowed to bury liquids because the liquids can escape and go down into the water supply. So they said, okay, we'll put in cat litter. So they said, make it, um, uh, they said, let's use inorganic cat litter. And the person who was taking notes wrote, an organic cat litter. Mm. So they went out and they bought tons of sweet scoop, this, this <laughs> <laughs> organic cat litter, sweet, you know, sweet scoop spelled with a, like wheat, uh, the natural clumping litter for your cat. And the, so the Department of Energy bought lots of organic cat litter. The problem is that the organic cat litter mixed with the radioactive salt to become a patented explosive. And it blew up uh, underground, causing this, hu this huge accident on Valentine's Day in 2014. So this was right around the time we were was making the film. And, um, and, and then I, I just want to end by, by saying, so, so one of the, scenar all the scenarios ended with disaster. Somebody, something happened and people penetrated the site. They didn't believe the markers, the markers got stolen. And many of these things happened in Japan to their markers. People, I mean, forgot what the markers were. There's one marker that was discovered recently in a graveyard and people just thought it was another gravestone. Uh, some of them got taken for building materials, the way some material from Stonehenge has been appropriated over the millennia. Um, and so they, but they said that we want one scenario that works out well. So they had a scenario that involved a character modeled on Mickey Mouse that was gonna be Nicky Nuke. And they designed a museum, which was also an amusement park. This is 1992. Uh, and this was gonna, or not 1991. And this was gonna be a, a way that knowledge would be passed on from generation to generation. We would always remember it. And they said it's like the great myths of ancient Greece, or like passing on knowledge through the Catholic Church, or uh, even these more recent mythological or cartoon characters like Mickey Mouse would be passed on through an amusement park. And it seemed completely wild in 1991, 
Um, but in fact, nuclear sites have now become tourist attractions. People go to visit the Trinity site where the first nuclear, uh, the first atomic bomb, the first plutonium bomb was, was set off. Um, Chernobyl is a major European tourist site, or at least it was until the current war, uh, the current European war. Um, but there are tours, and you can go on them, and there, you know, there's there's sites to sign up for them. And in fact, in Kiev, there's a Ukrainian National Chernobyl Museum, uh, which is supposed to be instructive and 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 entertaining at the same time, and teaches you about the accident and the dangers of the the, the nuclear spew that's been left on the land. Even in Fukushima, people have begun to speculate about making a kind of memory and amusement park there as a way of preserving memory that doesn't exist yet. The one in, in Kiev does. So you have at these different levels the, I, I want to say, I'm against a technologically deterministic account. Kerner's Kletzography, the, the, this early 19th, mid 19th century. Ink, ink, ink blots did not lead to a re-understanding of the self. They were a game that people played. Tesla's teleautomaton self-directed boat didn't force us into a reconsideration of self. The 55-gallon drums of plutonium waste didn't push us to reconsider our relationship to land. But they were the conditions that then got adapted with prior existing notions of the self to transform the self and become ubiquitous ways of, of thinking and seeing who we are, whether it's seeing ourselves as projected or through magic lanterns projecting onto the world or self-correcting cybernetic machines uh, understood as a kind of cognitive variant of behaviorism or, um, or in a position where it becomes normalized to think about waste wilderness, these tracts of land, vast tracts of land sometimes, that are excluded from human use and also a place of enormous biodiversity as Savannah River or the Whip site or the Chernobyl region, uh, many other places. It's become a standard move now to make national parks or international parks or nature preserves out of contaminated areas because it keeps people away from the waste and allows the animals to, to exist there uh, and relieves the governments of, of, of having to do a proper cleanup. I mean, it has many functions, but it, it's begun to change our way of thinking about wastelands and wilderness, I would argue. So we have in these material episodes moments where we, we see ourselves differently and they, we train, we make the machines, but then the machines make us. Thank you. Thank you very much for this rich and thought-provoking talk. Um, we have, I think, 20 minutes for discussion and then we have to run to the train station. Uh, there are... Thank you so much for the talk. Um, I have a very general question, a very really naive question. <laughs> Um, I'm a philosopher. Yes. I'm a um, so, many um, discourses about uh, technology, the relationship between human beings and technology is, is often conceptualized as uh, something like an external relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, we have um, human beings, technology, they can, they can have an impact on each other, but they don't mutually. Um, uh, mutually constitute each other. Mm -hmm. In your account, since that, it seems that, that recognizing that technology uh, can help um, us to understand uh, who we are, it seems that the, this kind of relationship is not external, it's something that is internal yes. in some respect. So I'm just wondering uh, if, um, whether in this account, uh, the notion of deception and trust can play any role. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Thank you. So I, I agree with the, the, the premise of the question in that I don't think that there is a, a stable universal self that exists across history. 
we are always in technology. It's not like we're, there was a time before technology. We're always in it. It's always, you know, we're shaping the technologies, shaping the self. So yes, I think that the idea that there is a kind of pure self that's then influenced or bent like an electron in a magnetic field, uh, it would be a wrong way of thinking of it. And uh, I, I would say that questions of, of, of trust, uh, the, the characteristic ways that we have of thinking that join the affective and the cognitive, and I would take trust to be something like that, that our, epi our epistemological grasp of the world and what we trust are connected, right? So those questions are exactly, say, in, in cybernetic terms, what's being put under pressure. I mean, I think if you ask the cybernetician what trust was, it, he'd say, well, it's like purpose or generalization or it's, it's part of the, it's something that could be modeled. And you could, they'd say, you want me to program a machine that acts as if it has partial, a lot or extreme trust? We could do that. We could take in, so that would not address the kind of trust I think that you have in mind because exactly this, this cybernetic program might be something that you think has its limits. And I think that we're, we're in such a moment now with these arguments about uh, generalized intelligence and large language models and so on, and the kind of techno enthusiasm of Silicon Valley in saying these really are. It's just a matter of time before these machines are completely indistinguishable from us. Uh, they, you know, they would too probably say trust. Okay, well that's a programmable aspect of <coughs> machine interaction. And we would say, you want to model partial trust, you take information the machine gets and put some noise in it, and that's partial trust, or something like that. So I think your question goes deep, and it really has to do with putting a question mark or putting in brackets uh, the idea that one of these programs of behavioristically propelled uh, training systems, machine learning, AI, cybernetics, is, um, is all there is, that it exhausts the world. Thank you. I have two questions. The first is a bit um, branching on that one. What about the view of technological determinism being a sort of a false <coughs> problem in the sense that a sense and be like, well, well, technology is just society and that's it. I wonder what you think about that. And the second has rather more practical implications. So you were speaking about predictions before mm -hmm. and what that makes on the self. And the thing is, whether you think of a simple prediction as a simple trajectory of a customer choosing a product, or whether you think of building collective problems and configurations of systems, I wonder how can we build a balance between using these predictions for machine learning that are very useful, but at the same time allowing space for agency so that you don't end up with self-fulfilling prophecies like some previous myth or something like that. So how can we make them useful, but then not let people think that this is what's going to happen and making the future deterministic in itself as well? Yeah, I, I, I think we, we, we live in a time partly because of the economically driven hype of silicon, you know, tech talk that we, you know, we, we're often in a situation where some, we have make an object that does something and we assume that it's then just on the path to doing everything. A little bit like in the 1970s, there was enthusiasm over the artificial heart. And the idea was, well, the heart is just a pump. So we can make pumps. We're good at hydraulics. We'll make a pump, and it'll be like a human heart. And it worked really badly. Um, because bit by bit, it was realized that the heart is not just a pump. It's a very complicated hormone, chemical, biochemical interaction with the whole of the body. And um, the idea of reducing it to a sort of single level mechanical function stripped it, in fact, of its life supporting qualities. 
I think that's a kind of metaphor for where we often are, where we, we do, we predict what someone's going to buy, and we say it's just, or we, we, we program your, so you, you, on your cell phone appear news stories that you'll want to read, and we say, okay, so it's just a matter of time before that completely resembles human interaction. So I think as far as the future um, goes, it's important that you know, AI will ha does serve many useful purposes, and it may help us diagnose better cancers, and it may do many things that are helpful. But to say that it does a set of tasks, and therefore it is like us like in the moment that cybernetics found itself in 1950, I think would be an error. And not letting it, for just that reason, not letting it be a kind of future of human affairs from when to declare war to, you know, how to sort people into privileged positions. Thanks a lot. We collect two questions. Uh, yeah, please, please, please. Uh, Christopher, I want to say thanks for the ideas that have been recorded in this meeting. I think that will enrich uh, all of us. And uh, I have a little bit of a question slash observation. I think that we are presented with the evidence that uh, uh, human history is strongly bonded with the technology. Since our beginning, we have technology. I think technology has always been a way of how we express ourselves in a really broad sense, in the meaning of uh, uh, reaching our positions, reaching our needs, and everything else. And uh, I want to stress this interpretation of technology, of uh, a way of expressing ourselves. Because uh, I think that uh, we are really focused <coughs> on the fact that we are now interpreting humans as technology, but in some way, our uh, way of expressing ourselves has always been technological. And uh, I, think, uh, I think that I think uh, often is that we have only just reached a point where the magnitude of our technology is that big that we can uh, actually see our way of expressing ourselves technologically. And uh, we are making this uh, logical short circuit in uh, which uh, we see ourselves as a technology, but uh, and we think that this is because uh, we use technology, but it, it has always been, because uh, we, express, we, we are technology, we express ourselves as technologies. Just that. Yes, I think it's good. I follow up. Uh, okay. Thank you for your presentation. I have a question because I observed that some of the regime, regimes of self uh, that, that were described <coughs> seem to me very stable. So, for example, the Rorschach's test is now widely accepted. I'm sure there are many uh, cr uh, critics of it, but it's largely accepted. While, for example, the regimes of cells uh, related to nuclear waste from the start are very unstable. We don't know how people will react uh, in the future, we immediately, or I'd say immediately, regarding the, the studies, understand that this new way of thinking about people is uncertain. We don't know how to approach it. I can think of another example. So, for, for uh, the way we think about gender, which was developed in the 1800s and in the 1900s to uh, medicine, but which was very normative, was very stable. So women are this, men are this because of these hormones, etc. And then, because of activism and because of further study, it became unstable. Now we are in a phase where people are trying to change how we approach gender in a medical and scientific sense. And so my question is, if you agree that these regimes can be stable or unstable to certain degrees, and how and why this may be. So if there are certain characteristics in the way they are constructed that make them more stable for a longer time, more normative, or they uh, show us an instability that we didn't know before. Was a follow up to Okay. Um, well, I thought the, the first comment that we were always 
embrigaded in technology and we should recognize some of the ways that that, that we shouldn't see it as entirely external, that it's not something recent, that it, I mean, I think I, I tend to agree with that. To, to your comment, uh, I would say, what stabilizes, I don't think there's one universal cause of what causes stability in a technology, why some last longer than others, but um, with nuclear waste, for example, I actually think that it, although nobody has a good plan for how to properly dispose of nuclear waste, and in that sense it is unstable, um, there has been a significant slowdown in the building of nuclear power plants, um, and not for, I think, purely ecological reasons, or even because of accidents, although that played a role in certain countries, like Germany, but I think it's just become very expensive relative to other forms of generating energy. There's also the experience, like the government of Sweden fell twice over plans to build nuclear waste facilities. I think there's a growing sense that you can't put waste where people really oppose it, and that there's a kind of consent-driven consent notion of where to put the nuclear waste, and an obligation to mark or warn. And I think that's true in Europe, uh, in, in many of the Scandinavian countries. Uh, it's you know, become part of how it's being thought of in, in uh, northeastern France. Uh, and, uh, there are other places in, in, in Germany. The, there were a series of waste sites along the partition between eastern and western Germany back before reunification. Uh, both sides put these their waste near where the other country began uh, as a political gesture. So politics also shapes these things. But now I think there is a kind of, there is, a, there is more stability around it, not because there's a great solution. You can't make it go away. Nuclear waste is not, you can't launch it into space. You know, rockets explode. It's too expensive anyway. It's a million dollars a kilo. And there are millions of tons of this stuff. You can't put it into the ocean. The law of the sea forbids that. You know, you, you can't put it in a volcano because then it gets spewed out. I mean, there are lots of things you can't do. So it turns out that it, burying it is more and more, I wouldn't say stabilized, but there's more, and that where it's buried has to be consent driven. It has to take into include hydraulics and the water in the area, use patterns and so on. So I think they're, they're, th these technologies are to a certain extent stabilized not by some innovative, brilliant piece of mathematics or, or mechanical design, but by big political economic forces. And that, that can help put these things into a more stable relationship. And I think that, you know, I, I don't mean this talk at all to be anti-technological. I don't even know what that would mean. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I use machine learning, AI things, and the work I do on black holes every day. I mean, it's, I don't think we should like, go back to some sort of Stone Age civilization, um, but rather that we have to understand technology in a broader context, and whether that's a critical assessment of what it means for what it says about who we are, or whether it's practical or toxicologic or toxicity or other dangers that it might present, that we need to take those into account. So um, I think the question of stability is a deep one. Uh, I don't think it can be answered from inside the technology. I don't think technological determinism helps us very much at all to understand why things happen in the technological world. Many of you are engineers, um, or architects, and you, know, you, you, know, you, you deal with the wider world all the time. You're not gonna put a building uh, up without you know, a lot of regulatory structures. You're not gonna build a, a power plant where uh, it, you know, it's, it's in proximity to other, other things and ec the economics of transporting power or where wind is or where solar uh, energy is, is, is accessible or you know, these, you're already in the mix of looking at things from a wider socio-political and economic uh, point of view and I think I'm, I'm just suggesting that these decisions um, shape all the way down to who and what we think we are. 
Thanks a lot. And whether is one last question? Not just one very simple. Okay. May I? Okay. <laughs> no, I just I was wondering because we have seen. Thank you for your lecture. Very stimulating. Uh, we have seen a lot of future, uh, like um, uh, like technology works. Uh, I mean, in a prediction way. Um, so my like like it it works like a time machine maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, so my question is, uh, what about past? What? What about past? Mm -hmm. Well, interestingly, um, although they had, they came to it from completely different paths, both the marking for the future and the idea of cybernetics involves the past. I mean, right from the beginning, what distinguished Norbert Wiener's predictor was the use of past behavior. It was a learning machine, a crude one, but a learning machine. And he called it that. You know, it's like you, it was not designed in general to make a prediction about where an airplane would go. It was designed to look at a specific airplane's movement historically over a minute and, and then make a prediction for several seconds into the future. And the website, they had, I mean, they had archaeology and historical linguists and so on, looking at the way lang languages evolved as a way of trying to say, you know, would people even be able to recognize language, our language, or languages spoken today uh, in the future? And they said, okay, well, the Rosetta Stone, that's a model for how people decrypted mm -hmm. a language, so we should put multiple languages together, inscribe them on stone, and bury them, or have them as markers. Um, so I think that the past, th this idea of, of modeling the exterior forms of what we do and using it to predict the future is deep into these technologies. Maybe less so with the Rorschach test, but definitely with the cybernetic and all that follows from machine learning, right? Is it supposed to take, or even the large language models, what does it do? It scours the internet steals people's material and then predicts what what you might what it might say in the future. So uh, I think that the the past and the future are very closely coupled here.